This morning our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. Now the wise Solomon once said, you can make many plans, but God's purposes will prevail. Two and a half months ago, Tammy and I were going to Myrtle Beach for a week of rest and relaxation. And all that changed when Tammy became sick. And eventually I took her to the ER and I expected the, uh, the doctors to give her some medicine and make her better and then we'd be on our way to Myrtle Beach. But that wasn't the case at all. And what I've learned over the last 27 years of following Christ is this, not to get upset when my plans fall through. When our plans don't work out, we have to trust that God has a better plan, that his plan will prevail. Today's message is about trusting God's plan. Every time I turn my phone on, this message pops up. You can worry or you can trust God, you can't do both. And for the Christian, we only have one choice, right? We must trust God. And in our text this morning, we find the disciples and Jesus out in the wilderness where a large crowd had followed them. The disciples had not planned for this event. In fact, they had tried to slip away from the crowds, but the crowds continued to follow them. Matthew tells us in his gospel that Jesus had just learned about the death of John the Baptist. And in his grief, Jesus had gone off for a time of prayer and reflection. But as the crowds pushed in and interrupted him, Jesus looked at them and had compassion for them and healed their sick. Now, anyone who works in the healthcare field or who's been to the hospital uh, lately knows that curing the sick can take some time, especially when there are a lot of people who are sick and needing healing. But consider for just a moment what Jesus was going through when all this took place. He had just found out that his friend, someone that he had great regard for, had died. Jesus said among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. So he was mourning the loss of his friend. Now imagine the resilience it took for Jesus to put his feelings aside so that he could focus on the people before him. As we think about this miraculous event in the life of Jesus and his disciples, there are several things that we can learn from it. And the first lesson is this, God is in control. 
Now, sometimes we think that we're in control and we like to imagine ourselves taking the wheel or taking the reins and being in control of our lives and, and doing what we can physically and mentally and emotionally uh, and, and thinking that we're in charge. But in the, re the reality is that God is in control of our life. In verse 5, uh, Jesus asked Philip, where should we buy the bread? He asked Philip, the question about buying the bread, not because he wanted a solution, but because he wanted Philip to exercise his faith. Nothing that day caught Jesus off guard. And nothing that happens to you will catch Jesus off guard. It may catch you off guard. It may surprise you. It may floor you. It may cause you to think, but it will not catch Jesus off guard. He wasn't worried about this situation because he had this situation in control. He was in control of everything that was happening this day. God doesn't need the resources that we possess to accomplish his mission. He isn't in heaven anxiously wringing his hands wondering if we are going to step up financially. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Every resource we are in possession of this morning is from God. And if we don't leverage our resources for his purposes, God will not throw up his hands uh, in exasperation and walk away from his mission. He will simply go somewhere else to another church or to someone else, someone who is ready to exercise their faith. However, God does invite us to participate and join him in his victory. The little boy with the five loaves and two fish learned this. The disciples who served the people that day learned this. And I believe that God wants each of us to learn this today. And we need to remember that God is in control. Secondly, God is concerned about you. He is concerned about every aspect, every detail of your life your emotional and physical well-being, as well as your spiritual well-being. There is nothing that he is not concerned about that's going on with your life. He knows what's going on in your life. And he wants to come to you and help you and to, and, and to help you to embrace this and to help you get through this, no matter what it is. There's a great story of a young father and daughter who went on a, a getaway cruise because his wife, her mother, had just died. And to help relieve the pain they comforted one another on this cruise ship. Uh, one day on the deck of this ship, the little girl asked her father, Daddy, does God love us as much as Mommy did? At first, the father didn't know what to say, but he knew he couldn't sidestep his daughter's question. So he pointed to the, to the farthest horizon in one direction. He said, God loves us more than you can see in that direction. And then he pointed in the other direction. He said, and, and God loves us more than you can see in that direction. And then he pointed up into the sky and he said, and God loves us farther than you can see above us. And then he pointed down to the ocean and he loves us as deep as the ocean. And in that precious moment, the little girl said to her father, just think, Daddy, we're right here in the middle of God's love. God's love is encompassing and his love reaches down from the heavens and it envelops us in our time of need. He comes to us and that day on the hillside, Jesus showed the thousands of people that had followed him just how much he loved them. And I believe God wants you to know today just how much he loves you and that he is concerned about every detail of your life. So what are other lessons that we can learn from this miracle? Well, we can learn that in God's hand, a little is a lot. When Jesus performed the miracle that day, he began with only five loaves and two fish, borrowed from a little boy's lunch. To feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish is indeed miraculous, but the Greek term used in Matthew specifies that the 5,000 were men. And Matthew further emphasizes the point by, by adding besides women and children. And many biblical scholars believe the actual number fed that day could have been as high as 15 to 20,000 people. 
that were fed that day with a little boy's lunch. Do you know how to get an old preacher excited about doing ministry within the church? This is it. Living into God's promises. We sing about standing on the promises of God, but we need to start living into the promises of God. Think about the promise Jesus shared with us 2,000 years ago. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus' disciples wanted to send the people away that evening because it was approaching darkness and they were in a remote place and, and their plan was to send all the people away and, and the disciples gave Jesus several good reasons why they needed to do that. However, when the disciples came to Jesus with their concern about the people you know, being hungry and needed to be sent home, Jesus met their complaint with a solution. And he says, you feed them. I love that, don't you? You feed them. They come to him wanting to know, what are we going to do? And he says, you feed them. This is where the disciples' plan begins to fall apart. You see, Jesus was in control, and he was concerned about everyone who was there that day. And most importantly, Jesus had a different plan. The disciples knew that the people needed to reach the surrounding villages to buy some food and find lodging, or they would go hungry. But Jesus had a better plan, and his plan prevailed. He said, you give them something to eat. You feed them. At this point, the, the disciples should have recalled the many miracles that they had seen Jesus do before. And perhaps some of them did, but Andrew asked, what are five loaves and two fish for so many? And, and Philip added, it would take more than a half a year's wages to, to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. When you think that the little you have to offer God is not enough, you might just hang on to it and never make that offer. But in the hands of the master, a little is a lot. So Jesus called for the little boy's bread and fish to be brought to him, and then he gives thanks for the meal, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples to give to the crowd. And amazingly, the entire multitude was fed with that small meal. Jesus provided, the Bible says, as much as they wanted When's the last time you went to a catfish house and ate your fill? Some of us like catfish. I like catfish. And when I go to eat catfish, I usually eat until I get my fill. Think about what it says. Jesus provided as much as they wanted, and they all ate and were satisfied. Jesus not only met the need, he met it abundantly. He blessed them with so much food that the Bible says the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. God will always shatter our limited expectations if we will learn to bring him what we have already been given. Little is much when it's in the hands of the master. When we are willing to offer our lives sacrificially, relinquishing the hold on whatever God has given us in terms of time and money and talents, God will use those ordinary things for extraordinary moments. He will bless our life with extraordinary moments if we will surrender our life to him. As Christians, we must never believe that our resources are too little to serve God's purposes. God delights in taking a, a meager offering from a humble servant, servant and using it for his glory. And lastly... God wants us to trust him so he can empower us. It's noteworthy that Jesus fed the people through his disciples. Jesus could have fed everyone there, but he didn't. Instead, he gave his disciples the opportunity to distribute the food. In this way, the disciples had to trust the Lord for everything they gave out. They could only give away what they had received. Let me say that again. They can only give away what they have received. That's the way it is for us. You can't give Christ to someone if you don't have Christ in you. 
You can't give grace away if grace is not in you. You can't give away something that you do not possess. And Jesus, you know, helped the disciples to understand that. And the disciples were put into this position of total dependence upon the Lord. And God still uses people the same way today. Even if we have problems, and most of us do, there's no excuse for sitting around and doing nothing. God knows our problems, but if we will do what he's calling us to do, he will take care of all our problems, use us for his glory, and then bless our obedience. As Christians, we must bring our lives to God in a spirit of obedience and sacrifice. No matter how big our problems are or how insignificant we think our gifts are, when we do that, we can expect God to do far more than we can imagine but we have to trust him. At some point, the little boy had to release the food that he possessed. He had to turn it over to somebody. I like to imagine that that, that little boy just gave it to Jesus and put it in his hands. And at some point, the disciples had to take what Jesus was giving them and then distribute it to the masses. And at some point, hopefully, you will put your trust in Jesus. And when you do, you will discover just how much he loves you. After learning of, of God's love, the magnitude of God's love for us, we learn the lesson of discipleship. A, a disciple is a dedicated follower who, who follows Jesus' lead. We join Jesus in mission St. Augustine said, without God, we can't. Without us, God won't. We are the hands and feet of Christ. That's the calling that he has put on each of our lives. And the lesson of discipleship isn't an easy lesson to learn, which is why this last lesson is so important. When we need it most, when we have stepped out in faith, God will give us the power to do his work in this world. Think again about the situation the disciples faced. There were thousands, tens of thousands of people on this hillside, scattered all across this green, lush, grassy knoll. The disciples are standing in front of Jesus with five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says to them, you feed them. Now here's my question for you today. What would you have done? I thought about some of the things I might have done. Actually, I thought of some things I hope I wouldn't have done. <laughs> but think about this. Maybe you would grab the five loaves and two fish while mumbling, this is not enough to feed all these people. How many times have we done that? Well, I guess I'll go down there and do this, but I don't know why somebody else can't come with me and help me. I don't know why they you know, want me to do it, but I'm gonna go down there and do it anyway. Or maybe you say to one of the other disciples, why is he trying to embarrass us in front of all these people? Why is he asking us to do something we can't do? Or maybe if you'd have been one of the disciples in the back, you could have slipped away into the crowd without anybody noticing. You could have just kind of walked away from this opportunity. But here's what we need to do. Thank God for what you have. Trust God whether it's a little or a lot. Then as you share it, God will magnify it and he will multiply it abundantly and enable you to do even greater things than these for his kingdom. That's the key to spreading the gospel and Michelle talked about it. It's the key to a fruitful and effective ministry. We join together in unity and faithfulness and God will work through us. So remember, when your plans don't work out, don't worry. God is in control. And God is concerned about every aspect of your life. He loves you with an everlasting love. And in God's hands, a little is a lot. Offer God what you have. And lastly, God wants you to trust him so that he can empower you to do even greater things for his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.
thank you for loving us and allowing us to participate in your victorious mission. Thank you for giving us the abundant resources to use for your glory and for opening our eyes to the needs of our community. Thank you for this church where we can be filled with your love and direction and strengthen to go back into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, you know our unbelief. You know our frailties. You know our failures. But if we will have the faith of a little boy, you can take the little we have and do extraordinary work through us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Maybe you've struggled lately in trusting Jesus with your life or with your resources. Let me encourage you today that if you're ready to make that commitment to Christ, Christ is ready to receive that commitment from you. This morning, I hope that you will not leave without putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ.